Hello, salut tout le monde. Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to a webinar on wine faults and taints. So we are going to go through a few of the issues that sadly may arise in the production on and storage and service of wine. Before we do, hi. So I am Jimmy Smith. I am the owner of the award-winning West London Wine School in Fulham in London, the United Kingdom, also a part owner of South London Wine School, uh, and uh, also an owner of a cool, funky little wine bar down in South London called the Streatham Wine House. Uh, all of my Twitter handles are there. Please, if you enjoyed the session, if you want to ask a question and leave some feedback and comments, please do. Uh, I think the best one would be at Wine with Jimmy, as that's my personal handle um but all of our details are there with our wine and tastings and courses as well we have both courses at the school and also at the uh, online we have of course lots of courses online so let's go through a little bit about wine faults and taints the first thing to talk about is in fact understanding the definition between those two we commonly talk about wine faults we go oh this wine is horrible it's faulty take it away it's horrible faulty faulty we don't often talk about, in fact, what it should be called, which is taints. Um, a, let's talk about those. So a, a wine fault is something which has happened from the production stage of the wine. Now, this may be something around the lines of um, volatile acid. This may be something around uh, bretonomyces uh, or uh, reduction, for instance. And they are wine faults. And taint is something which is more of an external force, not necessarily to do with the wine itself, but something else around it. So something like a cork, for instance, and of course that's cork taint, but you have others like smoke taint, eucalypt taint, and so on. Um, we only really be, will be looking at cork taint on this one, which is possibly one of the most famous taints that you can get out there. So that the, the differences between those, uh, those two. It is a remarkably complex topic because it spans a multitude of thinking and disciplines. So there is microbiological things involved here. Uh, of course, acidic based compounds are involved. Um, storage and service is involved, uh, but also things around the, um, the human perception of these faults or taints. Sometimes these are considered actual complexities within a wine and not necessarily a fault and taint and maybe even temporary, temporary as well. So therefore these are quite complex because some people will see them as faulty or tainted and others will not. Uh, so it is a real complex topic which has to always be reviewed with caution as we will do as we go through this. Um, now, that's what I mean here. So not all faults are agreed upon and there are many personal preferences. So one quite specific one is actually the increase of reduction through green compounds within things like Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is often quite powerful, certainly from areas like New Zealand, lots of that kind of green pepper pyrazine characteristic. Um, now, that's a, they're actually based on reductive compounds on thiols. So you'll actually find that some people love these, some people really don't. Um, there is also the amount of um, reductive sulfur compounds as well, which create often a flint or struck match uh, characteristic. Some people love these, some people don't. So there are many personal preferences which really are involved in this. Um, there are some that are clear cut. There are some that definitely are faulty. And if you like them, it's a bit odd. Um, but uh, for the most part, uh, there actually is a question mark around quite a few of these. Um, and as mentioned, some of the perceived faults can actually add uh, complexity. So, for example, um, Nebbiolo can often have a bit of uh, a, a, a kind of a volatile compound to it, which gives it this kind of tar or bitumen sort of note to it, uh, even rubbery character. But because it's so complex as a grape variety with very high acids and tannin levels and a huge, huge list of aromas and flavors, it actually is said to add that bit of complexity. You could even look at things like in South Africa, like old vine pinotage, which produces some real structured, powerful wines around Stellenbosch, for instance, uh, great examples like Cannoncop. Uh, and you'll often find there is a marked little note of um, uh, aldehyde ethanol, that kind of uh, acetic note to it, which is 
Uh, often some people associate more towards nail po um, polish remover, but uh, in very small doses, in with a lot of complexity, you don't notice it that much, and it actually gives a bit of a lift to the wine, a bit more in sort of intensity behind it, which can actually add complexity. So do, do bear that in mind. It's quite common also on natural uh, wines or skin contact styles of, uh, of wines. The first one we talk about uh, is what this picture is de uh, depicting here, which is cork taint, uh, which is, I put this first because it possibly is the most talked about. It's actually not the most common, but it's definitely the most talked about, the most known. You may, you may have actually uh, uh, um, picked up a wine and opened it uh, with a cork closure and smelt it, and it's very, very off and very musty, and that is cork taint. So we're going to understand what it is and what it smells like. So, um, so cork taint, of course, is this kind of musty uh, smelling taint. It is a taint. Um, it is nothing, nothing to do with bits of cork that may have disintegrated from the cork in the bottle. It is not a sight. It is a smell and a taste. And often you don't get to the taste because it is so very prevalent as a smell. Musty smelling, damp smelling. It may be considered things like old clothes. I've had some students often, and I'm very sorry to charity shops about this, but some students in class before have said it smells like a charity shop. But it's really that kind of old clothes, the clothing kind of musty smell that can be found uh, from it. Um, this will diminish uh, the primary aromas in the wine. Uh, so the fresh fruit and floral based compounds and, and can actually in very high percentages completely overpower the wine where you really can't smell anything else. If it is a minor based cork taint, uh, you will find this dumbing down or um, diminishing of primary characteristics. You may only pick up a light amount of this uh, cork taint, but, but uh, not everyone is very well trained at picking it. Some people do get cork taint confused with oak and wood maturation, but it's a much more musty, almost fungally based characteristic. Um, so cork taint actually comes from the production of the cork and it's a, uh, a microbial contamination of that cork and it comes from really the cork plantations. Uh, and it is uh, from something which is called TCA, trichlorine anisole. And I've got slides on this coming up in a second. Um, so, it is where the cork plantation, some of the trees are infected with uh, a fungus. Um, that cork is uh, is used and it will impart this kind of fungally musty characteristic into the wine. Now, with very high hygienic standards today and high production quality levels of cork, this is becoming a lot less common. But go back to sort of 30 years plus, and it actually was exceedingly common. I've heard people say it's probably somewhere between 10 to 15% of wine closures were corked uh, going over 30 years ago. Today, that number should be somewhere below 0.5%. Uh, of course, there are some variants on this, uh, on this number. Um, it is considered always a fault. There is no, uh, there is no way around this. It is a fault. Um, it isn't uh, uh, something to be discussed uh, and it isn't something that adds complexity in any way. It will diminish wine's characteristics and overpower it. So, like I mentioned, it is important to understand uh, the kind of compound behind it. And the compound behind it is 246-trichloranosyl, uh, something we call TCA. And you'll, you'll, in, uh, you'll note here um, the, the two parts really to note quite significantly is chloro and then anisol. Uh, so this is the major compound. There are others, but this is the compound which will come from cork itself. So from cork taint. Now you can actually get this kind of cork taint musty characteristic from contamination from uh, winery equipment, oak barrels as well. But this is very, very uncommon. Um, so let's take a, take a look at that chloro. That actually comes from chlorine. And that is because during a lot of the sort of 1950s towards the 1980s, in the huge cork plantations down in Portugal, there was a huge amount of uh, sort of agrochemicals used with chlorine included in them uh, as insecticides to uh, help with any problems within the cork plantations. That chlorine has actually seeped into the landscape, into the microbiological landscape, into the fungal networks, and will actually remain there for quite a significant time. So we will find that this compound is brought up by 
uh, by the trees, by the cork plantations, and will react with the, the phenolics. And this is what creates this compound, this kind of musty, uh, this musty compound within the, uh, the cork bark. Um, so yes, formed in the cork bark uh, by those phenolic compounds and chlorine, as I just mentioned. Uh, and PCA will actually give you um, characteristics like musty, dampness, wet cardboard, old clothes as well is listed. There's a picture of some damp cardboard in uh, on that slide. Now, um, the last thing to sort of mention before we move on, I do need to mention that this, remember, it's not a sight. You can't see this problem. It is a smell and a taste. Uh, and it is um, it is uh, something which is being combated today with better hygienic standards in the cork plantations of Portugal and Sardinia. But also uh, um, there are different closures. We have got diam closures. We have got uh, plastic closures. We've got screw caps, glass closures, etc., which will near enough eliminate this uh, threat of TCA. Uh, so there are ways around it. The next one to mention is uh, is oxidation. Uh, and uh, oxidation is uh, something which you must immediately think of as both a positive and it can be a negative. It depends. Now, we will focus as a fault majorly on the negative side of oxidation. But controlled oxidation, of course, is something which is widely practiced and, in fact, completely integral into the production of wine. Uh, it is something which is integral into balancing tannins and softening tannins. Um, creating softness uh, in a wine, bubbling oxygen through yeast uh, to, uh, uh, to oxygenate the yeast. Uh, there is a huge list of things that oxygen is used for, um, which is remarkably important. So there are lots of positives around it. And there are many wines that are positively oxidized as well. But we're, I've got the picture here of an apple that oxidizes. It oxi oxidizes very quickly, of course, without any alcohol. But um, that is a, an effect of oxidation, as you can see. So what it is, it is a loss of freshness in the wine and quality when a wine comes into contact with oxygen. Of course, that's found within the air. Oxygen makes up about 20, 21 percent of the Earth's atmos atmosphere uh, and is the uh, component which we, is integral into our life. It is what uh, supports us. Uh, but also uh, it ages us at the same time and it ages wines uh, at the same time as well. Um, you'll often find that oxidation co-occurs with volatile acids and bretanomyces as well, two things we'll talk about very soon. Uh, and as this is when we're talking about when it really starts to age and oxidize, a volatile vinegary compound may be there as well as probably an earthy, leathery, barney characteristic as well, certainly in red wines. Um, oxidation because of modernization and understanding winemaking tends to be rare at that stage. We don't tend to find a huge amount of oxidation at that stage. There is lots of natural protection from gases that are given off, um, better equipment today. Um, but the common area of oxidation tends to be because of us, the consumer. So it is common at the storage phase and at the service stage. So this is uh, storing it in the wrong conditions, in hot and cold conditions, uh, prematurely uh, premoxing it, prematurely oxidizing it, and service is a big one. Happens very uh, frequently in pubs and restaurants where they are not looking after their wine by the glass list to the highest level. Uh, and this will, of course, impart a lot of oxidation to the wine, dumbing down its freshness uh, and losing its kind of fresh character. But please remember that there are many positively oxidized wines, many uh, long term age red and even whites will go through controlled oxidation through things like oak barrels, wood. Uh, so that's wood maturations as well. There are different types of wood used, cherry, chestnut, uh, things like acacia uh, and so on, pine. So, um, of course, that is used and that is used to gain gain complexity, to soften the tanning uh, in wine. Uh, um, but also, um, yeah, to add that level of complexity behind it. Uh, other wines are very much proudly all about oxidation, things like vin jaune in Jura. Uh, so this is yellow wine. This is uh, under yeast, but also oxidized. Um, fortified wines will commonly go through oxidation, things like sherries, ports, Madeiras, Marsala. 
Orange wines uh, can go through it as well. With their extended skin contact, they are naturally protected against uh, oxygen, but they will therefore often be able to go through extensive aging. And there are many, many others as well that will go through positive forms of oxidation. So please do remember that. Um, oxidation smells. Now you can see oxidation because it will turn the color. Um, it actually oxidizes the anthocyanins, the pigmentation in wine. Uh, so red wines will end up turning into a more garnet brown tawny color. Whites go more golden and eventually ambery. Um, aromas, though, tend to be this kind of bruised apple characteristic. Um, and that is really where the, uh, the oxygen uh, here is, um, is, is converting the ethanol into an, uh, sort of an uh, aldehyde characteristic where you get this bruised cooked or baked apple note. Uh, and then eventually a nutty kind of characteristic. But there are many other instances. There are honeyed and toasted notes, dried fruits, dried roses, dried flowers. Uh, and of course, that often can be combined eventually with volatile acid, uh, of uh, a sort of a vinegary characteristic with a bit of age. Um, so yes, let's move on to volatile acids, something I'm quite sensitive to. Uh, so VA, volatile acid. So what is it? Um, so first of all, volatile acid uh, is something which is that the formation of, of acetic acid by uh, bacteria during winemaking. And really the word volatile is, is, is really because we can smell it. It's made smellable. It's made um, um, uh, vaporized from us. So uh, these are volatile compounds, therefore, that are vaporized at room temperature so we can actually smell them. Um, and they are formed via acetic acid, uh, so that's uh, things like acetobacter, uh, acetobacter rather, um, which um, will uh, produce these kind of uh, compounds, uh, which we're going to go through things like vinegar, etc., during the winemaking phase. Um, so it either creates really two main areas: either acetic acid, which is our kind of uh, vinegar-based characteristic, often. This is due to old uh, sort of aging wines or ethyl acetate, which is um, the smell and aroma of nail polish or some people say kind of creosote or paint like characteristics uh, as well. Uh, now, in wine, generally, these are not accepted as uh, good quality. Um, they can be quite overpowering. Um, but in very small amounts, they can actually add complexity. Um, and they can add a lift to a wine, um, but it is considered a fault at high levels because it will overpower the style of wine. I did give an example earlier of Nebbiolo, for instance, with its complexities can have uh, small amounts of it adding more complexity. So VA smells of vinegar, it, feels, it smells of kind of like nail polish remover. Uh, so that is um, those two major areas that, that are produced from it. Uh, there are some wines in the world that are quite prominent with this. Uh, these do tend to be more natural uh, produced wines. Uh, some biodynamic whites can often have a vinegary based characteristic as well. Um, there are uh, notes of sort of uh, acetone in wines like um, younger vine pinotage in South Africa. Uh, you may find a little bit of it uh, down in that neck of the woods. Now, a very big category. We won't go into huge details on it, but these are your reduction and volatile sulfur compounds, VSCs. Uh, and there's a picture here of, uh, of, of gun flint, an old musket gun flint, as that is one of those uh, areas. Uh, and another thing about this is, again, this can be uh, it's a very complex subject, this one, which can be both positive and negative. Um, so reduction, then, is the name of um, the excessive presence of the VSCs, the volatile sulfur compounds. Uh, and really reduction, I mean, wine making itself is a reductive process, uh, which kind of uh, flushes out the oxygen. It is reduction chemically is the opposite of oxidation. Um, and there are wines that are made, most wines are made reductively today without the presence of oxygen uh, in things like stainless steel and inert vessels, for instance. Um, the excessive presence of the volatile sulfur compounds, which may be found, may be partly due to the yeast not having the environment that it wants or needs 
So maybe there is a lack of nitrogen for it to ferment uh, and it may slow down or get stuck. It may produce a few more of these, uh, these sulfur so, uh, volatile compounds like hydrogen sulfide. Um, most hydrogen sulfide that is produced via fermentation is actually blown off with carbon dioxide. Um, but if the yeast does struggle, it gets in a bit of a difficult, sticky situation and the stuck fermentations come through, then hydrogen sulfide may be a little bit too dominant uh, and it can create some very off-putting aromas and flavors, which we'll get to uh, 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 in a second. So as it mentions just here, it is uh, mainly hydrogen sulfide based compounds. Now you're talking about a major compound produced in wine. Sulfur is present in all wines. It is produced via fermentation. There are small amounts produced of it. And then of course, sulfur is used in the winery as well as, uh, as sulfur dioxide, as well as in the, in the vineyard as sulfur. So you will often find higher or increasing levels of sulfur in the wines. Um, and this will combine with hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and can impart very specific aroma compounds due to that. Um, so it is mainly produced, as I mentioned, uh, these reductive compounds via yeast metabolism. So the yeast working on the sugars, and as mentioned previously, may become quite stuck uh, and produce more of these reductive compounds. It is not always considered a fault, a fault, and it can be tempor temporary. Sometimes they can blow off with a bit of oxidation, such as German Rieslings, for instance, which have quite a uh, kind of sulfury struck match note initially, but it will blow off. Um, so there are instances where it can be integrated. Um, so for instance, a kind of typical Burgundy model with Chardonnay is that sulfur is used all the way up towards the end of the year before harvesting, uh, and the amount of uh, sulfur that we find on the grape skins when it's actually crushed, that adds to the sulfur within the wine. And this produces that quite clear minerality note, which is quite classic of Chablis. New World producers of Chardonnay today across the world are now producing uh, 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 their Chardonnay in this method to create this more Burgundian model, such as uh, in uh, places like New Zealand, for instance, with Kume River, which is a uh, some wonderful, wonderful, elegant Burgundian type Chardonnays. Um, so the reduction compounds, of course, are rather complex. Um, now they, uh, there are many of them. So if um, if you have uh, you have too much hydrogen sulfide, uh, and it actually is embedded in the wine due to a, a poorer fermentation, lack of nitrogen, for instance. You will gain things like rotten eggs, sewage or drain-like characteristic may come through. Uh, these are all very much wanted to be avoided uh, and can be exceedingly stinky in the wine as well. Um, so that is, um, that is hydrogen sulfide based characteristics. You can get things like uh, um, dimethyl sulfate, which is more things like canned corn, uh, things like cooked ca cabbage as well. So there, there is definitely common as well. Um, there's many others as well, which move all the way through rotten cabbage, onion, burnt rubber, and down to gunflint. Now I've actually grouped these here. If you go below burnt rubber, there are actually quite a few quite positive characteristics. Uh, and that's where we have uh, more of the, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the passion fruit, the grapefruit, and so on. Um, and this is where we find things like uh, you've got uh, uh, what's what's classed as uh, metacarpohexyl acetate, which is the uh, acetate, which is the passion fruit characteristic and a bit of grapefruit as well, which you will find in things like Sauvignon Blancs, for instance. Um, but uh, they can be wanted and they, they often can be quite desired. And Gunflint and Struck Match, which is the benzenenomethanothyl, <laughs> it's one thing I struggle to say, it is uh, quite classic for uh, that kind of minimally compound within, uh, within, within the wine. So reduction can be both a positive and a negative. Um, quite a famous one is Brettanomyces. So this uh, is um, a, a yeast strain, which is uh, another one which is mainly considered as a fault, but it doesn't have to be, depending on who you are and what you like and what you want. 
So amazingly, we don't talk about it that much, but it is an amazingly very common microbiological fault that is caused by uh, by wild yeast, by a, by a fungi. Um, so um, this is something which is called Brettanomyces uh, bruxellinicis, uh, and it's kind of a British wild yeast and a kind of uh, uh, Belgique wild yeast, which um, is now, of course, spread around the world and propagated around the world. Um, this yeast is um, exceedingly prevalent. It's, if you give it the right conditions, it will uh, it will grow very well, propagate very well, and you'll find it in a lot of areas. Um, it uh, it loves grapes. Uh, it loves um, wi old wineries. Uh, it loves um, oak. Uh, so you'll often find that winemaking processes are actually the key kind of area for Brettanomyces to actually uh, um, really grow very well. Um, and the thing we need to mention is that some winemakers will happily accept that Brettanomyces will actually work on their grape juice making wine and add more complexity. Um, there are some that find that even the smallest percentage, if, it, if, if there's a little bit in it, then your wine is faulty. So it really is a bit of a Marmite philosophy, Brettanomyces. You either love it or you hate it, um, but as soon as a wine has a bit of it in it, it will gain and gain and gain and gain as that wine ages and eventually become so powerful that that wine will really not have much balance left down the long haul. Um, now, there are many ways that you can combat against Brettanomyces. Um, really about the fruit that you are handling, uh, Brettanomyces does not like low pH conditions. It hates high acids. So therefore, uh, you will not find it in lots of white wines in the world, which generally do have very low pH, pHs and high total acids. Uh, that is quite um, quite toxic to Brettanomyces. But in areas where there's a lot of reds, in warm conditions where pHs tend to be a little bit higher, maybe 3.5 to 5, you will find that these are quite good conditions for Brettanomyces. The way that they have to combat against that in winemaking is actually controlling it then by sulfur dioxide, killing it from, with using sulfur dioxide, or being exceedingly um, hygienic when it comes to the cellar. So that's wine cellar uh, management, very important. So what happens though if Brett does actually impact your wine? Then, uh, I mean, there are famous products in the world that uses Brett. Uh, wild beers, for instance, around Flanders and Belgium, uh, and north uh, eastern France will 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 use Brett in their huge open fermenters uh, and very openly uh, talk about it as a as a key instigator in complexity in their beers. Um, and in wines, there are some people that do that as well. And this list I've given you here, from the top to bottom, is a list of things that probably from top to bottom goes from ex some acceptable notes down to quite challenging. Um, and you'll see here we have medicinal, could be considered quite good and complex in a wine, leathery, quite good as well, smoke and spice, those three areas all there tend to be something we quite like in complex measures in wines. So, um, and that's kind of early stage Brettanomyces or very small amounts of it. Um, then things like horsey or saddly character, mouse urine, farmy, manure, metallic, band-aid, a lot of these are considered quite intensive and most people will not be able to uh, smell a wine and go, oh, lovely, um, lovely uh, manure-y, mouse -y no urine notes to that. That's going to be an unusual thing to even recommend in wine. So um, that's when Brettanomyces really gains momentum and starts to take over the wine. Uh, and uh, there are many wines that can find this, this high amount. A lot of natural winemakers, um, there's some brilliant natural wines made in the world, but some uh, where they do not control temperature fermentations, they do not get rid of any Brettanomyces, they let everything ferment quite naturally, um, will find that that can be quite a, a big instigant, uh, key factor in, in the wine, these kind of characteristics. Uh, so there, there are definitely a stages of Brett, manageable stages. I kind of get it can get away with small doses of it but when it gets to get gets a get bit too old and a bit too dominant and a bit too stinky then that's when i have to take a step back from uh, from brettanomyces okay